Hello everybody and welcome back to Citizen Sleeper. We've got a lot to do today. A lot of it, well most of it involving mushrooms. Um, I don't know where to start, honestly. Um, we have a lot of things to do. Oh, we definitely need to help uh, Bliss. That's probably something we want to start with soon or fast, just because that's going to take a little while. And then, okay, so Fangs Bay, we're still waiting on that, but this will be done in two cycles. Uh, oh, these guys are here. We can help them out. We could buy some scrap as well. That might be worth it. Um, maybe. For now, let's go to bed. We'll feed our cats. And then we'll go to bed. End that cycle. Next one. Maybe we'll actually disable our tracker this time around. That'd be fun. Oh, and we should also probably forage for some mushrooms as well. Let's see. Building is chaotic. Most of it is in total lockdown. Okay, so we still don't have anything on that yet. That's okay. Uh, oh wait, don't cross. We need to go to Bliss. A sender car. There it is. Alright, let's see. Saving the crop. I believe we could pull this off right now. Oh, yeah, we're good. Nice! Uh, let's see, random scrap item. Oh, thank you. With Bliss at your side, you work neatly. It is impossible to cause no damage, but you limit it the best you can. Alright, so we need to be careful. Do that one. Uh, working in the wet and the heat is a trial. You make progress, but the plants near the bulkhead look half dead. It's okay, we're almost done. Last one. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Let's not risk it. If we have to do another cycle, it's fine. There we go! It's done. You and Bliss are floating in the bay's airlock, waiting for it to cycle. You pick a few leaves from your clothes as you wait. They float around the chamber as if carried by a lazy wind. Clean work. Bliss bows a little. Well, thank you, sleeper. You didn't do too bad yourself. She checks her tool belt. Seems we're getting into a good rhythm. The now familiar sequence of clunks and rattles sound out, and then the door hisses open. The moment it does, you know something has once again gone wrong. Oh no! What's all this? Bliss asks a confused-looking Moritz. Beside him are a set of crates anchored to the bay floor. He has clearly just brought them in through the bay's freight lock. Moritz looks nervously between the two of you before answering. It's payment. He runs a hand along the crate. The Sycamore Seed crew brought them over. He stops, but seeing the look on Bliss's face, adds, They were very thankful. I bet they were. She clenches her fist. What the hell's inside? Moritz leans over and struggles with the catches on each side of the top of the crate. As he does, Bliss turns to you. Don't say it. Bliss stares into space. Don't you dare say it. I won't say anything. Don't. She gives you a hard look. This is my f this isn't my fault. Moritz finally gets the catches and free and the lid floats off, drifting up into the bay. As it does, a small brown lump floats up with it. Moritz reaches out and catches it as it passes him. Is that a... Mushroom. Oh my god, of course it's mushrooms. Bliss finishes. A damn mushroom. They paid us in mushrooms? Not just mushrooms. He holds out a clump of tightly packed leaves. Produce. Bliss starts laughing. Goddamn Haifa commune. Should have known they didn't have a chit to rub between them. She knocks a small brown mushroom across the bay. Stop, Blitz. Mortz grabs her hand. These are good. Fresh. We can sell them. To who, Moritz? Are we running a grocer's now? We need cryo, otherwise this whole bay will be shut down. We can't pay for parts with leafy greens. She waggles them in Moritz's face. I, I could use them. No, no, Moritz is right. Bliss raises an eyebrow. Fine. Maybe Moritz is right, okay? But what do we do between now and market day? She rubs her forehead. What a joke this place is turning out to be. Moritz closes up the crates and starts moving them. It isn't that bad, Bliss. It's a step in the right direction. He glances at you, looking for backup. They'll sell well. Bliss sighs. Looks like I went into business with a couple of wannabe farmers. She laughs. <laughs> Prove me wrong, then. Show me this is a windfall. She kicks away towards the new patched-together terminal. 
Until then, I'll be working on how to keep this place open. Moritz mouths a thank you and goes back to moving the crates. You'd better be on your way, too. Well, that didn't go good. But at least third time's the charm? Fingers crossed? We'll see. Alright, let's head down. I'm gonna try a reroll. That didn't go in my favor, but it's okay. Well, it kind of- no, I don't think it did. We'll do this. Get some of that extra data. Always good. Uh, and we'll use this last thing. I haven't even started Rabia's quest, and I think this is connected to Sabine, so... Let's do this one. Alright, not bad, not bad. Oh, what the- as you say your goodbyes to the other enforcers and walk back through the low end, a chirruping catches your attention. In a quiet corridor away from the main thoroughfare, someone has stuck a small recorder to the wall with suit sealant tape. Written across the fluorescent tape is one word. Sleeper. You peel it away from the wall, and as you do, it triggers some kind of improvised trip switch. Sleeper. Sabine's voice crackles through. I've seen you with Yadigan members. Are they holding you captive now, too? A high whine. I'm sorry if I have dragged you into this. Do not trust them. Something is happening within the gang. Some kind of power struggle. You cover the speaker a little, their voice too loud in the quiet corridor. I will come soon. Thanks to your efforts, I have located most of their properties. At the right time. A pause. I will see you soon. Don't give up. Remember our deal. The recording cuts out. I hate to break it to you, Sabine, but so much has happened since you were gone. <laughs> You stare at the recorder, processing what you've just heard. Hearing Sabine's voice again opens up something inside you. An SNARP employee. Do they know what I know? You struggle with the mix of concern and distrust. You throw the recorder into a nearby waste chute as you leave the corridor, still unsure who to trust, and head quietly out of the low end. Hmm. I'm not sure who to trust indeed. Well, let's sell some data. By the way, I sold the data last time. That's how I have money again. I did that off-screen because I reloaded to make sure that the mushroom that glitched out was still here. And it is. It did not disappear. So maybe we should go give that away right now. Here we go. Where are the mushrooms? Yeah. Here we go. <gasps> yes! You hand over the caps and Rico looks pleased. My amateur mycologist. Thank you. Need more mushrooms? Rico meets you at the entrance to the lab, leaning over her crutch with a glint in her eye. Walk with me, sleeper. I'd like to tell you a story. She makes her way down the corridor that leads back up towards the main commune building. When people first crossed what we call Founder's Gap into the Greenway, they did so against the wishes of Andre Erlin. At the time, Erlin was trying to stabilize the Union and establish control over the Eye in the wake of Solheim's collapse. It was chaos. Competing factions, failing systems, so many dead and injured from the riots, that was his priority. You both crossed through a glass roof tunnel, the greenway outside crowded with vines and branches stapling the light. Erlin had written the greenway off, cut off from the rest of the station and linked to a broken spoke. He claimed it was only a matter of time before everything here would die. He refused to let anyone abandon their duty to the Union and cross. They were traitors to the cause, or as good as. Rico continues, making her slow but steady way to the inner gardens of the commune. There weren't many of us, but we believed that here was worth saving. We had to keep our plan secret until we crossed, and some of us left people behind. She pauses to catch her breath, her voice cracking. It is difficult to know if from effort or emotion. What we found was a disaster, nothing like what you see here. Half of the greenway was leaking oxygen into space. The plants flash frozen, the other half was a swamp of mulch, as decaying matter clogged every system. We worked hard, we lost good people, we cleaned up and closed up, but it was never going to be enough. After many, many cycles, we all knew this place was doomed, but we kept on working, talking less and less because we couldn't face it. We'd all developed a death wish. If the Greenway was going to die, so would we. What changed? Everything, Rico smiles. We crossed some invisible boundary, tipped some biological scale, and the Greenway started to recover. 
Plants flowered, crops sprouted. For the first time, we reaped the fruits of our labor. Rico smiles, looking up at you. We thought it was us. That we managed to do just enough to end the cycle of decay. I thought we had saved the Greenway. Until today. You pass into the grow beds of the commune, rich with the hustle and bustle of Haifa members planting and harvesting. For a while, Rico is quiet, and you both simply observe the hypnotic movements of the work crews, the eager chatter washing over you like a wave. Rico smiles to herself. I should have known, of course, that our arrogance was unfounded, but we needed to believe back then. We needed a myth to bring more people across the gap. You both move into a smaller corridor, Rico following some direction unknown to you. What you have shown me is that back then, the Greenway saved us, not the other way around. Tell me, have you ever consumed one of the Matsutake or Girol caps you have been growing? Yes, I think I have. I mean, I, I brought some to Emphis and ate them, so I'd say yes, I have. I imagine they were delicious, nutritious, almost uniquely so, she muses. After all, they were designed for you. Rico has a mischievous look. At first, I thought it was the location they were grown in that made the mushrooms from the aviary, from the labs, or from the grove different to each other, but what I have come to understand is that it is the person growing them. That Matsutake and Girol caps you brought me are totally unique, containing compounds never usually found in similar specimens. In my possession, many of these compounds aren't even digestible for humans, but for a sleeper like you... Rico smiles as she leads you into the internal gardens of the commune, where the Haifa members have planted species from all over the Greenway. Back when the tide turned, when the Greenway started to recover, we all felt something. A response. It was as if this place was not just alive, as alive as a forest is alive, but alive in other ways. Communicative. Responsive. We shrugged it off at the time, but now I understand why. Are they talking about the gardener, the one who gave us the seed? Rico stops and turns to you. This place is a responding to us, adapting itself to us. It is growing fruiting bodies for you, for me. It is adapting, changing. It is, in short, displaying all the signs of sentience. How? That is what I wish to know, too. What being is in control here? Rico sits on a bench within the peaceful gardens and gestures for you to join her. When you have been growing the Girols and the Matsutakes in the aviary, those species so similar, so familiar to the Greenway, have you discovered any others? I have, I have actually. Riko can barely contain her excitement. I should like to see those. Please bring me some next time you are here. You look around the garden, amazed at the sense of peace within it. Riko interrupts the silence. There is a species of mushroom that I haven't seen in years. It is dark, short, shaped like a club. We first found it in those early days, when we were working to save this place. It was around that time that we started to lose our first members. Club head caps? Yeah, I have those! They were succumbing to some infection, some mold growing deep in the dark mulch that drowned this place. At that point, we thought we were lost. Then these mushrooms emerged from that same black mold. We tested them, and saw that they contained some compounds that contracted the mold. They contained an antidote. Of course, as a botanist, I saw this as part of the natural process of this ecosystem, even if the timescale seemed absurdly short. But what I am wondering is if that antidote was a gift. Rico meets your eyes. Perhaps, if you are patient, you will receive your gift too, sleeper. <gasps> Ooh! I do have a gift! I just need to plant it! You both sit for a while, Rico seemingly done telling stories for today. You watch the light playing off the leaves and plants around you and wonder what forces could be at play in this place. After a while, you stand to leave with a quiet nod to Rico, leaving her to her memories. Wow. So what do we need now? Club heads. Three club heads. Well, I have one. And I have three gear rolls still. I think we definitely need to plant some more in the aviary. That'll take some time, but a lot of things are taking some mushroom time right now, so let's go back to sleep. Feed our favorite little buddy. Repair ourselves a little bit. There we go, and end that cycle. What was that noise? 
I don't know. Not good rolls, but not bad. Let's go see what's going on over here, though. I think things should be done. Fang! Fang grins at you as the bay door slides open. Above, in the rest of the building, people are busy, frightened. They speak in hushed tones and organize endless meeting after endless meeting. Haven Age have avoided a full-blown crisis for now, but change is coming. Fang is in good spirits and bundles you inside before you even have a chance to greet him. That was the slickest operation the station has seen! He hugs you firmly. You made my job easy. He shakes you by the shoulders. I'm so proud. And, he smiles, I got to watch through the cameras as the Haven Age security that weren't in on it assaulted the station. Fang smiled. One of them straight up just whacked Harden with their pistol. It was beautiful. They have him? He's being held, yeah. He looks around. I think the idea is to use him as leverage with Conway. Get them to back off. Maybe they'll exile him when they're done. Or hand him over to some core authority. Fang shrugs. Now I know he won't be an issue, so I'm going to focus on systems for a bit. He shakes his head, seeing as that's my actual job. He points to the ceiling. The people upstairs weren't so happy, though. They've been fielding questions about the state of the eye right and left since the recording got out. People are scared. I'm not surprised. Yeah, the whole thing hasn't won me many fans in administration. But I think in the end, they'll agree that outing Harden was worth it. Whatever the methods. He touches a stack of hardware. The eye is old. It was never meant to run like this. The master control points that Erlin and Haven Age installed, they keep, spin keep it spinning from the rim. That isn't ideal. But if you're asking me if the eye will stop spinning next cycle, no. He smiles. And me and a ton of other skilled people will be working to stop it happening in the cycle after that. Harden's problem was that he didn't believe in people. He believed in systems and their ability to shape the world around them. Fang squeezes your shoulder. But as far as I'm concerned, people should be the one running the systems, not the other way around. Anyway, Fang wraps the side of his terminal. I know you didn't come down here for a lecture. My tracker? I haven't forgotten. He produces a thumbnail drive. I managed to finish that code solution I showed you. It's a modified ripper worm. One made to deactivate that tracker of yours. But in the time since I got back, I added something extra. That tracker of yours doesn't just show Essenark where you are, it transmits data about the state of your body, your current condition. My worm won't just deactivate it, it'll edit the data to tell Essenark your body is irreparably damaged. DNR. Do not retrieve. He grins widely. Pretty smart, right? Wait, so will my condition always be stable? Thank you! Just slotted already. You take the drive and hold it in your hand. Then you close your eyes and open up your access ports, take down your defenses. The worm immediately enters your closed network. It whips through it, taking things with it as it goes. The moment they're gone, you forget they were ever there. They just blink out of existence. A second later, it is done. You open your eyes. How do you feel? Asks Fang, a little nervously. Free! <laughs> Fang smiles. Well, you are free, sleeper. He claps you on the shoulder. Fang lets out the word free hang in the air a little before he continues. Seems like it might be finally time for a celebration. Fang wraps his arms around you. Jenna still owes us those drinks. He laughs and you join him. And later when you leave, you feel deeply thankful for having such a friend. As you walk away from the building, you look up at the wide curve of the eye. Up at the hub and the other rim beyond it. The whole thing twinkles with lights. And it seems impossible to see it as anything other than breathtakingly beautiful. It feels, in that moment, like something eternal. That doesn't mean it can, or even should, last forever, or that it will never change, fade, or decay. It simply means that in this moment, this place is a future, and it is one that you know, deeply and truly, is worth protecting. Wow. That's beautiful! Oh, and we're almost ready to upgrade some more. We need more points. But awesome! Our tracker is gone! We're free! <laughs> We did it! I'm very proud of us. Oh, and what's over here? Tala! Tala comes to you one shift when the bar is empty, tapping you on the shoulder as you clean the bar. It's ready. She's grinning from ear to ear. The girl? Obviously! She grabs you by the arm before you can ask anything else and drags you into the back room. The smell hits you immediately when you enter, a cocktail of rich fermentation and chemical sharpness. The room is warm and bright now, the newly installed lights making the place look clean, whether it is or not. <laughs> Tala has already pulled a couple of stools around a metal crate, where two glasses with a few fingers of pale gear roll sits inside waiting. She smiles. I haven't even tried it yet. You can see she's nervous. 
You both sit at the makeshift table, the slight strangeness of the situation making you both jumpy. Tala hands you a glass. Cheers, she says solemnly, and knocks the glass back. You do the same. The first sensation is burning, a sharp nose-clearing blast of alcohol that has your frame querying whether you would like to activate safe mode. You gulp the drink back, and it is only then, beyond the burn, that you taste the earthy tones of the mushroom, the wood, the soil, left behind like sediment, barely there. That's strong. Tala nods vigorously. Oh, that was heavy. As promised, though. You think? She swirls the glass and puts it down. Wait, I have an idea. Tala grabs a, water bo a metal bottle from the newly installed work surface and adds a few drops of water into the gear roll. Try again? This time, the burn is a warming glow, harsh but fading off, and the woodiness less heavy. You taste something floral in among the marshy decay, something fresh and bright that you never expected to find. Both you and Tala meet eyes. It's really good, right? It is! Tala grins with her whole face, and that makes you smile, too. Tala pours out some more gear roll, and then adds some more water. The action's already taking on the quality of a ritual. You both drink. Tala tucks her feet up behind her on the stool, folding her legs. She looks down into her glass and swirls the liquid thoughtfully. What's on your mind? Tala looks up, at nothing in particular. My father opened this place up, you know, she says out of nowhere, a thought suddenly becoming words. It was his attempt at making a life for us, for my family, when we got to the eye. Your family? My father, my mother, my little brother. She takes a drink. They aren't around now. I'm sorry. That's okay. My parents had long lives, and my brother is somewhere in the Starward Belt, ran off with the salvage crew. She puts her glass down. He's alive, as far as I know. I was just thinking about something my father told me. When he first set this place up, he wanted to call it the... Bantayan, but he was afraid it'll scare off customers, so he kind of translated it. Hence the overlook. And these past few cycles, when I've been in here, I've been thinking I should rename this place. She looks at you. The Bantayan. What do you think? I love it. She looks away. Me too. Tala picks up her glass. That settles it then. To the Bantayan! You both clink your glasses and drink up. Tala hisses through her teeth. Still harsh, she laughs, then suddenly grabs your shoulder. Oh, sleeper! I totally forgot! She stumbles to her feet. She lurches over to the corner of the room, covered with a plastic sheet, and whips it off, like a magician performing a trick. Beneath it is a neat little kitchen, a sink, a work service, and a compact oven with a hob. Your kitchen! She doesn't give you time to respond. You can make stuff here any time, as long as you promise not to raid the mushroom farm. I need those for Girol. I was thinking, too, that if things pick up, we can start serving proper food at the overall... I mean, the Bantian. She laughs. Do you like it? Thank you. Tala gives you a hug, then quickly stands back. I'm sorry, I'm just... I'm so glad you're here. She grins. Me too. As Tala tidies away the t glasses, you inspect the kitchen, checking that it all works. It's small and salvaged, but after what you've had to put up with, it feels like a dream come true. Later, when she's done for the day, Tala comes back through the bar and you share a good glass of the girl, the one she didn't distill. And this time you talk about nothing in particular, sharing stories about regulars or discussing the best place to eat on the eye, which, which, after everything that has happened, feels like a nice change of pace. When it comes time to leave, you promise to cook for Tala and agree to let her know which shifts you'll be working in the coming cycles, and then slip out into the cool of the rotunda. And in this moment, you feel, for once, at home. Aww. We've made a home for ourselves. Help a friend distill their future. That's awesome. Oh, and I can cook. Here, let's cook. You haven't exactly mastered the art of cooking mushrooms, but a couple handfuls of fried gear rolls always beats expired rations. It does. Look at that. We can cook and we get energy. How cool is that? Oh, plus three. Aw, yeah. Oh, man. Man, the power of mushrooms. We're just like God right now. <laughs> God is mushrooms. Maybe we should finish this up, too. Since we're here. Or try to finish it up, I guess I should say. Huh. Yet again, insider. Try this one. Alright, getting there. We'll do this. Uh, and we'll stop right there for now. I will use this one to get some Haven Age data for some moolah. I'll save this one 
I don't think I need the three. And then we'll do one more cycle, why not? I would like to finish up and also get some mushrooms. Or at least start getting some mushrooms. We need that money money. Wait, do I need money still? Maybe. We'll find out. We'll find out. Let's still self-repair. Nice. Uh, and feed the meow meow. There we go. And end that cycle. Okay, so our s condition still does go down, but that's okay. We have a way better way of working with it now. Now let's see. Where is... There it is. You think we can do it? Three? We can do three. Why not? Boop -ba -doo boop boop. Boop-a-doop boop. Get some more scrap as well. That'll be helpful for our condition. There we go. Let's see what this does. This time you meet inside Rabia's office, although now that you've seen it, the office seems like the wrong term. You find her stood in an almost bare, shadowy unit, midway through a sequence of stretches. There are now two low stools and a terminal in the corner, but it seems that most of the space is taken up by a heavy punching bag, rubber matting, and a sack of weights. When Rabia turns to greet you, you realize she's missing an arm. The prosthetic she usually wears is set in a cradle near the terminal, and a web of colored wires running to it. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That's a cool arm. Updates, she says, noticing you looking where her artificial arm usually is. Nothing to worry yourself with. Of course. Sit, says Rabia, gesturing to the two diminutive stools. You both settle on the stools, Rabia crossing her legs on top and sitting straight backed. Gia told me you have been doing the rounds, collecting tithes, patrolling the ward. She smiles. Some of the enforcers are impressed, and I hear you handled a few difficult circumstances. Nicely done. I wanted to see for myself. She raises an eyebrow. See what for yourself? If the stories are true? I see. Rabia flexes her neck side to side. And the conclusion? Only the good ones. Rabia laughs. Well, that is good news. She closes her eyes for a moment. I hope you can see how things work here now. A strong Yadigan means a strong low end. Both are woven into each other. I know that for you, life on the eye has been a struggle. But I hope we can do something about that from here onwards. Though some of our members may not see it this way. I know you too are a refugee. She looks at you solemnly. That is why you have come to us. Whoa! Hi, Sabine. <laughs> Enough, Rabia. Sabine's voice cuts through the conversation. I'm tired of listening to your affected nobility. They cross the room, Rabia's baton in their hand, the end lit with sparking electricity. Rabia looks between the two of you. I suppose this ambush was another cooperation between you two? She looks strangely unfazed. Oh god, what do I do? I'm not saying anything. Sabine pauses, thrown off by your silence. I'm sorry, Sabine! Oh! Rabia takes this opportunity to act. She leaps up from the stool, fainting past Sabine, grabs the baton and twists it inwards. She is far stronger and she pushes Sabine to their knees, plunging the crackling end of the baton towards their chest. They freeze there, Sabine struggling to keep the cracking baton from their skin. Stop! Then you support them, Rabia asks you, her eyes not leaving Sabine. Your loyalties are so easily swayed. I thought you were more than Yannick's attack dog, Rabia. Sabine spits back. Are you not able to think for yourself? Rabia holds the baton strong, and for a moment, you think she is about to hammer it down into Sabine's chest. But after a painful wait, she throws Sabine down instead, then spins the baton in her hand, thumbing a switch and shutting it off in a single mood. Rabia, explain! <laughs> they both look at you, still catching their breath, as if they had forgotten about your presence. Explain what? How the moment I call, my enforcers will come down here and take them away? Rabia cracks her neck. You're lucky I didn't kill you. I would have had every right. Every right, she shouts, the anger a release of tension more than a threat. Sabine lifts themselves a little. Bruised from the fall, they roll onto their side and cough. Rabia gives them some space, sitting back on the stool. Sabine props themselves up on their elbows and fixes Rabia with a hard stare. You have something to say, Rabia taunts. Say it. 
This is your final opportunity, because after this, <laughs> no coming back. What's the point? Sabine breathes heavily. She refuses to listen to criticism of the Great Yadigan Project. Rabia collects herself. Speak. She folds her arms and waits to be convinced. Sabine takes a breath, organizing their thoughts. They go to start, pause, and then decide on another approach. Eventually, they say it. Yannick is a traitor. Rabia immediately flinches, her eyes going to her prosthetic arm, her muscles clenching. But she rides it out, more eager to prove Sabine wrong than she is to hurt them, at least for now. When I came here, for Messenarp, they glance at you, gauging your reaction. It was Yannick who was the one of the first to support me, to look after me. I should have known then, but I was naive and afraid. Sabine turns to you. Sleeper. They take a breath. I know that I should have told you I worked for SNR long ago, but I thought you would abandon me, and you are my final friend. Now I feel bad for not saying anything. What you should know is that I left SNR because I was running for my life. I leaked documents on the sleeper program, on the illegal and immoral practices it relied on, to the press. Oh, SNR wanted me dead, and I fled as far as I could to this refuge at the end of the surrogate systems. Sabine stops to collect themselves. What does this have to do with Yannick? Rabia interrupts. The sleeper knows you are Essenarp, I told them. And while you hide beneath the cover of being a whistleblower, you and I both know you worked on the sleeper program. Yannick told me as much. Sabine's face falls. It is true. They glance at you, and then away, ashamed. They lift their head. But it is Yannick, not me, who is in the pocket of Essenarp. Rabia flinches again. I can prove it. He made some kind of deal to keep me here, to tie me up in debt, to lock me away, in exchange. Rabia slams her hand on the desk. Just tell us, for God's sake! In exchange for those, Sabian finishes, nodding towards Rabia's prosthetic arm in its cradle. He has been using Yadigan enforcers, using you, as test subjects for SNR technology. I have the data to prove it. He has been bringing them in under the guise of stolen shipments and having me fit them knowing each one is capturing data and sending it back to its makers. Rabia's fixed expression has started to fade. Sabine produces a slate. It's all here. Thousands of hours of usage data. Failure rates, error dumps. These are untested implants, Rabia. They could short out, fail, cause cascading failures across a person's body. And they have. Sabine suddenly looks incredibly tired. I thought the error rate in the units was down to them being stolen or modified. I've tried to fix hundreds of failures in my time here. Not all of them. They stop, unable to continue. Rabia closes her eyes and breathes in. Then she opens them again and holds out a hand to Sabine. Show me, she says. Later, much later, when you leave, Sabine is still talking Rabia through the manifests and usage data, both of them crowded around the terminal, as Sabine leads Rabia through each layer of Yannick's betrayal. As you leave, Sabine catches your eye, and passes something between you, something like a thank you or a sorry, or some other expression that communicates both sadness and hope. Well, that definitely went better than I thought it was going to go. What's, what's it now? Enemy of my enemy, Rabia and Sabine have been holed up in her office for a while now. What are they planning? Okay, so that's three cycles. Well, that wasn't helpful. Hmm, what should we update? We could get a plus two. Hmm. I think we'll wait. Wait, yeah, what does this take back here? Because this is the one thing I have done the least of. Uh, it is interface. All right, let's upgrade interface then. We're gonna need it. There we go. Oh, that's the wrong button. We're getting there, we're getting there. I wanna fully upgrade everything. Wait, why am I going over here? I don't have- I don't have things. Well, that is wild. I think we're gonna do- I know I just said we were only gonna do one more cycle. We're gonna do one more, but that's mainly just to get some mushrooms started, because we need more mushrooms. We'll just do that, because I don't think anything else is gonna load by then. So we'll get ourselves some mushrooms all set up. That way we can worry about everything else going on around us when we do the mushrooms next time. Or, well, when we play again next time, I guess I should say. <laughs> now that we're done talking with everyone. So, let's actually sleep in the Haifa dorm tonight. Why not? 
we'll repair ourselves again. And end the cycle. One more cycle. One more time. I just like playing this game. I can't put it down. Alright, that's pretty good. Alright, let's get some spores. Let's see. Boop -boop. We just need three. Oh, we're gonna be good. We're gonna be good. Aw, yeah. Our mushrooms, baby. Maybe we'll get more club heads. We only need two more. We'll definitely be harvesting the best we can, though. We want to get good rolls, good growing. There we go. Nice. Now we just need to wait for that to grow. Let's roll one more time. Ooh, look at that. That's actually really good. Let's use this on the other one that we're working on. And also hack uh, Yadigan if we can. Yes. Aw, yeah. Dun, dun 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 And where was it? Aha, here it is. Side rail bridge. Oh god, yeah, we have a long way to go. Did it go back? I don't know. Maybe this is something that we have to, like... We have to work a lot? I don't know, if it felt like it went backwards, but maybe I'm wrong. Either way, I think as I sell the last of my Haven Age data that that is where we're going to end it for today. A lot of stuff happened, but a lot of- it was all pretty good. We finally got to see, see Sabine again, I miss them, and I'm glad that they turned out to actually be up to good. I, I didn't ever think that they were really bad. I mean, I had my suspicions, but why would they have helped us otherwise? But now, I have faith. I trust them, and hopefully we'll be able to take down Yannick together. It's another Harden. We got this. We are gonna do it. And, well, we've got other stuff to do, like mushrooms. We're gonna help Bliss. Um, maybe we'll see Fang again. I don't know, but I really want to plant the seed. So we gotta get those club heads so we can learn more about the gift we were given. But we'll do all of that next time. Until then, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. Remember to take care of yourself, remember mushrooms, and have a good day.